Edward Johnson now took care of Astrid Varney's vocal capital. Uh, I remember Edward Johnson, he didn't want to destroy my work by giving me too much. Yes, he, you said 12 performances. In, with, in, within a season. Within a season. And right. that included the jumping in. Yes. Of course, I felt very unhappy about it for a while, but I realized that he was right. Not to put me through the chopping. Yes, the grist of the mill. The grist, yes, of the mill. He took care of you. Yes. Just six days after her debut, Astrid Varney replaced Helen Traubel as Brunhilde in Die Walküre. With Friedrich Shaw, I sang the Brunhilde. That, that was really where I jumped in on the second Walküre for Traubel. And uh, I knew that the stage director wanted her to be quite a distance from her father, and then, like a child in the last minute, run to him, and he embraces her. What happened to me, my mother always said, be careful, don't get there too soon, what, in, whatever you do with runnings of that sort. In general. In general. Mm -hmm. If you get there too soon, it's no good. Even if you go a second later, it's even better than getting there too soon. Yes. What mm -hmm. happened was, though, not having had the possibility of having rehearsed it, <laughs> I ran to him, realized I was late, fell to my knees, and he slowly picked me up and whispered, Du wirst was. Yes. You will be something. And of course, the whole audience practically gasped. That hadn't been shown. It's like begging father. I just felt I have to do something, and it worked. Well, don't, don't ask me how. I had instinct on stage. Yes. You, you, were, you were not Astrid Varna, you were, you were Brunhilde. That's right. I tried to be Brunhilde at yes. least. She then sang Elsa in Lohengrin the following January 9th, 1942, her official scheduled debut date. Here is an excerpt from Einsam in Trüben Tagen, Elsa's Act One aria, and is from the broadcast of January 17, 1942, just eight days later. The conductor is Eric Leinsdorf. In February, she sang the first of three non-Wagner Strauss roles, participating in the world premiere of Manati's The Island God in the role of Telea. Having sung this and performances of Elizabeth and Tannhäuser, Ms. Varney had now performed five roles which she had never sung before in the space of a little over two months. What was that score like? The duet was magnificent, and I'm very sorry that Manotti destroyed it. Yes, he did. That's true. It was a, he should have at least left the duet. It was a beautiful duet. And also a, a, a trio, a terzet, you call it a terzet, with uh, the, three, uh, the two men and myself. It's a pity that 
I wonder if there is a copy of it somewhere. It would be, it would be fine. But they're not allowed to do anything about it. No. What was the music like that well, attracted? Well, it was very, shall we say, it showed emotion. And it had melody. Yes. And uh, there was this duet, which was very simple. And one said, thy mouth, and the other one said, and thy mouth. I mean, after all, those were sensuous words, but they weren't, they weren't blasted in any way. It became a love affair of these two people. Mm -hmm. Who sang the... the uh... Raoul Chopin, oh, Raoul Chopin. And, Warren. and Warren, Leonard Warren, Leonard Warren. and that was, a, that was a cast. She continued to study with her mother and work with Weigert, but could only afford one weekly session with him. The second session, Weigert took on credit. Their relationship, a marriage of true minds, turned into a personal one, and they married in May of 1944. In the mid-1940s, the Met was concerned that Ms. Varney might experience what she called in her book a vocal imbalance, a situation where her voice would mature faster than its musculature, and therefore a need for a vocal life jacket, being able to catch a problem before it developed into something detrimental. If this had happened today, she probably would not have had the career that we now know. The Met took very good care of her and saw her through her development. Johnson recommended finding a different teacher. He suggested a singer-pianist, but Ms. Varney's mother recommended Paul Althaus. Though his studio was new, he would eventually become known by the singing of two of his most famous pupils, Richard Tucker and Eleanor Stieber, two singers who share many vocal traits with Astrid Varney, endurance, dependability, and consistency. You asked me about Paul Althaus. Yes. As okay. far as uh, yep. uh, my, the, actually, I don't know how Paul Althaus taught Tucker and Mrs. Steva. But I know how he taught me. It has a background, and thank goodness I can say it today. The powers that be at the Metropolitan with Mr. Edward Johnson, uh, they felt that my mother was very fine, but that I should get somebody who was very well known as far as a teacher is concerned. Mother being cousin to a fox, I mean really, the, she was foxy. Yeah. She says, we'll pick a singer. They'll not be able to say anything against it. And so we picked Mr. Althaus. And I went there and sang Zieglinde with him. And he joined singing with me. Yes. And that, those were his lessons. But I did get one thing. Where the tenor goes a little stronger, I also got a little stronger. And where the tenor was lighter, I also copied. So, and without realizing, just I, got, I just had the feel of the stage with him. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Johnson accepted this. And there was no problem at all. And this helped your... That helped the powers that be realize that my mother and Mr. Althaus were doing their duty on Astrid Wagner. Because I was so young to sing Wagner. And they couldn't have anything against him because he sang Wagner also. And when I sang, he wanted to sing the same thing. So he chimed in. Instead of Melchior doing it, he did it in study. Right. I thought it was very funny. I had to pay him so that he could sing. <laughs> <laughs> and I say this truly, he was a wonderful person, and he had so much fun that I came out very happy. <laughs> he was able to sing with me. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he was obviously a good teacher with those. Yes. While refocusing vocal strength, there was an inner dynamic pulling Ms. Varney into heavier roles, characters of independence rather than dependence, from Elsa to Ortrud, from Sieglinde to Brunhilde. Here is Brunhilde's battle cry from the March 8, 1947 broadcast of Die Walküre, conducted by Fritz Stiedry.
In 1947, Ms. Varney added her final E role to her performing credit, Eva in Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg. She sang 14 performances over a period of three years, 11 at the Met and three in San Francisco and Los Angeles. It was also at this time that she began to radiate a flow of energy, and that, she believes, is the difference between a singer and a singing actress. Well, I must confess that I was not aware of this until a few years ago, when I was in my 70s. Somebody said, you're on stage and we have to look at you. What is that? that I believe it's charisma. I believe that the mere fact of being the role, uh, being the role meant to me, I tried without much difficulty to find who I was, and uh, do it as being quite natural. But my secret, if you want to call it a secret, while I was on stage, not singing, but being there, to listen to those who were singing, listen to what they were saying, and listening as if it was the first time that I heard them and react, in very small ways without disturbing it. I think I had a knack there which is by nature, especially in the first act uh, of Lohengrin, where Ortrud has practically nothing to do except absorb what the others are saying and make her own ideas while she was doing so. But I didn't walk across the stage, I didn't make any special movements, I may have made a, a breath or, or a turn of my body a bit. A facial expression. But even with my back to the audience, I reacted to what was going on. And I think that that tension may have transmitted itself to the public. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that words can't describe. Well, it's a personality trait, I think, also. Uh, when I saw Hotta, when I was not working with him, I had the same feeling. Something was emanating, which was the role. And I recall also when I had the honor of working with him, he liked to work with me, I believe, because he sometimes did something which was unexpected. Like uh, when, uh, when Wotan finally feels that he's going to punish Brynhilde, but he doesn't want to lose this love. He sort of moved his hand out, and I realized that he wanted me to come there and clutch that hand. It, it's something that I cannot explain. I was in the role, he was my father, and I was the child who didn't want to lose him. In 1948, Richard Strauss became a major font of roles for Ms. Varney. First, Electra, then Zalome and the Marshallin. That year, Dimitri Metropolis asked her if she would be interested in doing a concert version of Electra. He gave her a year to think it over. She consented and sang three performances in 1949 on December 22nd, 23rd, and 25th, a very taxing four days. This taught her a lesson. In the future, she must request four days between performances of Electra. We now listen to Ortrud's Curse from Lohengrin and Weiter Goethe from the broadcast of January 7, 1950. Helen Traubel sings Elsa, and the performance is conducted by Fritz Stiedry.
Astrid Varnay's second non-Wagner Strauss role was Amelia in Simon Bocanegra. She sang five performances, the only ones of her career, four in New York and one in Philadelphia. In spite of her successful engagements in other Verdi roles, such as Leonora in Il Trovatore and later Lady Macbeth, this was the only essay into the Verdian repertoire at the Metropolitan for Ms. Varnay. From the broadcast of January 28, 1950, we hear the second verse from Come in Questora Bruna. The conductor is Fritz Stiedry. In 1950, after Ms. Varnay received fine tutelage in dancing Zalome's Dance of the Seven Veils with the Met prima ballerina Irene Hawthorne, she felt she was ready as the cover for Liuba Velich. But by the time Velich arrived, Ms. Varnay had done all the rehearsals, including the public dress rehearsal. And Fritz Reiner gave her somewhat of a hard time. He felt that Ms. Varnay was not entitled to favoritism. After all, he waited seven years after her debut to engage her in Pittsburgh. He didn't want people thinking he was behaving nepotistically to the daughter of his old friends. But Ms. Varnay was too well prepared for backstage power games. During our conversation, Madame Varnay discussed the appropriate voice and house for the role of Zalome. 2,100 seats, perhaps one seat more or less, in Munich, in the State Opera, and Vienna, 1,800. Therefore, when I came to Europe, I felt the theater small compared to the Met. And, uh, at the time, when I was doing the Salome, 
there were people who said, well, Varna is an excellent Salome, but she doesn't have the Salome voice. And I thought to myself, well, they are not wrong, except in the Metropolitan you had to have the voice to make it sound. Whereas here they took a more lyrical sound as hmm. a real Salome. But you take a person who looked the part, for me, Stratus. She looked the part magnificently, she acted the part magnificently, but she knew fully well that she was not going to sing it on stage. Is it's there? a wonderful thing, yes, because the features of this woman really, she acted facially, bodily, vocally, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I was very pleased with my own on recordings. Oh, yes. The one that I have with Herman, my yes. husband. Yes. And uh, one can't have everything. I've had practically everything. You. <laughs> <laughs> Astrid Varnay sang the final scene from Zalame for the first time in an open-air concert in 1949 at New York's Lewison Stadium with the New York Philharmonic. Her public relations representative, Alex Williamson, told her to have a special gown made for the occasion and have the dress designed by the critic's companion. That would guarantee at least one good review. She was in extraordinary form that night and the reviews were ecstatic. Her gown was sea green with a silver lame underskirt and a huge provocative blood red bow on her side. She had become progressively intrigued with the role of Zalame. Varnai's approach to the role was different than Velich's. The Varnai Zalame was more sinned against than sinning. During the rehearsal period at the Met, Reiner demonstrated his excellent pianism but played some wrong notes. This distracted his heroine, and he stopped with an acerbic expression on his face, saying, Ha! So you know your role. Varnay replied, I'm supposed to, am I not? The public dress rehearsal took place on January 24, 1950. Just before her entrance, Varnay quickly checked the musical rhythm of her first vocal line, a place that Maestro Reiner had repeatedly complained about. She made her entrance and, once again, Reiner abruptly stopped and said in front of the audience, You came in late again. This demoralized her, but a few pages later, she got over it. This prompted her to give the show of her life. 